this is probably the fourth or fifth year that um, Catherine and I, and uh, with the help of Jose and some of the years, have teamed up to provide an update on what's going on in the courts and how it's playing out, um, both uh, at the patent office in terms of the ability of diagnostic companies to seek effective protection, and in the courts um, as uh, patent litigation plays out and impacts the ability of diagnostic companies to protect the investment that goes on um, to cover uh, the very valuable and innovative tests that are being produced. And we're going to continue that theme today. Uh, the talk is going to include a couple of different components. I'm going to start by talking about what the courts have been doing. Catherine is going to follow up by talking about how it's playing out in terms of the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office's efforts to keep pace with what the courts are doing and how that translates to practice tips. I'm going to circle back briefly on how it's playing out in the courts. And then Jose is going to wrap up by talking about how it's playing out in the markets. So um, with no further ado, um, here we go. So what's been going on for the last several years has been an unprecedented amount of activity from the courts in tinkering with the patent eligibility threshold, the Statute 101, which is really the statute that decides what gets into the patent system. It's policy-based. And the question that the courts have been asking are, where do we set the bar in terms of what we allow in so that the patent system affects its constitutional mandate, which is to promote technology and innovation? And there's been a lot of discussion lately that the patent system is broken, that it's out of balance, and instead of promoting innovation, it's doing exactly the opposite. And the courts have been working mightily hard over the last several years to try to adjust um, the threshold in order to get the patent system back into balance. Um, the language of the statute is enormously broad, and it's up on the screen. And what it says is that whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter um, can get a patent subject to the conditions and requirements of the rest of the patent laws. And notwithstanding that broad language, there have been a number of judicial exceptions, so court-made exceptions, to the broad statutory language that have always existed in terms of keeping stuff out. And these are laws of nature, or scientific principles, um, natural phenomena, or products of nature, and abstract, idea, abstract ideas and mental processes. And the notion is that these things are so fundamental that to allow patent protection on them would basically cut off from the rest of humanity basic fundamental scientific facts or principles um, or basic scientific you know, products, products of nature, and uh, that would be not consistent with the objective of promoting innovation. So starting in 2006, uh, there's been a level of activity that in the 25 years that I've been practicing has been, in my view, unprecedented. Um, and it started with the LabCorp decision, which was really bizarre, because the lab, basically the Supreme Court took the case up, and then they dismissed it without reaching a decision. It happens very rarely. Um, but one of the things that was noteworthy in uh, the LabCorp case was Justice Breyer is, uh, issued this blistering dissent saying that the case was absolutely correctly teed up, that the court should have decided on it, and basically should have found unpatentable as a law of nature the technology that was at issue there, which related to the ability to um, correlate levels of an amino acid homocysteine, which was easy to measure, with a vitamin that was difficult to measure. Um, so that was the first, basically, the first shoe dropping I think of. And then uh, there was a series of there was a series of decisions that followed, all of which have been unanimous, coming from the Supreme Court, all of which have held unpatentable under one or more of the judicial exceptions, the patent claims that have been before the court. So in 2010, there was the Bilski case. Bilski had absolutely nothing to do with biotech or diagnostics. It had to do with hedging. And the court said that the notion that was being um, patented there was basically an abstract idea. Um, and uh, struck it down. But one of the things that they did was they said that the Federal Circuit, which is the court below the Supreme Court, which is the appellate court for all patent decisions, made a mistake in saying that the test for patent eligibility for methods or processes 
was um, restricted to determining whether that method or process involved a machine or transformation. So in 2010, the Supreme Court said that the machine or transformation test was too restrictive, that it was informative um, and was very helpful guideline, but it should not be the sole test. It was too restrictive. So on the one hand, they struck down the patent, but on the other hand, they said that the test that the Federal Circuit had articulated was too restrictive. So that was actually an optimistic, hopeful thing that the court said. Um, but alas, um, their actions were, in subsequent cases, much more draconian than what they led on in Bilski. So in 2012, the Prometheus case that I think people may be familiar with had to do with the law of nature exception. This again was an assay, and again it involved a correlation, and it was the correlation between the level of a metabolite in the blood and the need to adjust the dose up or down. Court here said that was a law of nature mm -hmm. and uh, struck it down, but importantly, the other thing that they said was that the machine or transformation test that they had articulated in the Bilski case in 2010 um, doesn't save the claim. So notwithstanding the fact that there was a transformation in the assay as you were testing um, the stuff that was in the blood, there, were tra there was transformation to the metabolites as you went to measure them, they said that didn't save the claim. So on the one hand, in 2010, they say machine transformation, very useful, helpful test, and less than two years later, they say not so fast, even if there is a machine or transformation, it doesn't mean that the claim is patent eligible, so the noose tightens. Um, the next case was the Myriad case, and that was in 2013. I think everybody here is very familiar with the Myriad case. Um, and what that case held was that for, the, for um, products of nature, so a different exception, it had to do with isolated nucleic acid, and basically uh, what the court said was that um, isolated, in other words, taking it out from its um, native material, wasn't enough to save it, which was a dramatic reversal of, um, I would say, almost, almost 100 years of patent law. The original case was a Park Davis case that had to do with adrenaline. It was out of the Second Circuit of New York, and it was probably in the 19-teens, um, so basically 100 years before. So overruled the 100 years of precedent, said isolated is no longer a basis, and uh, basically we'll talk a little bit how that's played out later, but um, that was a problem. And then um, Alice, which had to do with computer science, followed the next year, again, a unanimous decision, and what Alice said was that um, the abstract idea exception, um, you don't say those claims, they don't become patent eligible just by putting computer implemented methods in front of them. So I'm going to turn it over to Catherine now. Could I have the, thank you. You're welcome. So in the face of, again, one after another after another, and we're talking the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, which they don't like patent cases typically, they steer clear of them, to have one after another after another come out like this and, and really create a, a huge frame shift, as, as Michael was just saying, the most recent one, for example, Myriad, absolutely overturn what had been well-established law about naturally derived products, including DNA, by the way. There was, a, there was a Supreme Court case directly addressing that question, which the Myriad case completely just threw out the window. What happens when you have big earthquakes like this, the U.S. Patent Office, in turn, which is what they should do, they, they try to address it, digest it, and create what they call guidelines that are to be used by their core, meaning the examiners, the examining core, as it's not quote unquote force of law, but it's supposed to be in view of the law, how does it translate on the ground? And then also those of us who are trying to obtain patent protection are supposed to look to those to see what their mindset is. And what happened in the wake of these decisions were a series of such guidelines. The first one was not very apropos to the situation here and now, but it was circling around this so-called Section 101 eligibility. Because eligibility usually, and in the old days and for years and years and years, was, was never an issue. It just wasn't an issue. Very rarely would it come up. The one in July of 2010 was in view of this more computery Bilski decision and wasn't, wasn't creating in really any ripples in the biotech and medicine industry. Then came along the 
in March of this past year, meaning in 2014, a new set of guidelines in view of these other more, you know, biocentric you, you, Supreme Court decisions. And they laid out, they being the Patent Office, laid out how they were going to approach these questions. Anything that involved a product that arguably, at least once upon a time, was natural, uh, DNA, antibodies, proteins, even small molecules, or methodology that involved them, or methods that were directed toward diagnostics, meaning identification based on a previously observed correlation, was fodder for this kind of analysis. Uh, in a minute, I'll get into the most current guidelines. But notably, when the one in, two, in, the, in March came out, uh, to use a vernacular, if you don't mind my doing this, all hell broke loose. It, it just did. Because what happened was that the, even with the guidelines, it was clear that anything that touched correlations, naturally occurring products. People were saying post myriad, well, maybe it'll only be DNA, but won't touch proteins, won't touch antibodies, which I thought probably wasn't going to happen in the patent office, and it didn't. The, the, the rejections came just, meaning, you know, subject matter was rejected out of hand, and the way that grid, the analytical grid was set up, there was very little leeway to try to get through it. Very, very little. Uh, for example, uh, with a methodology that involves sequencing for detection, and the detection and the sequencing involves a polymerase, that would be rejected because polymerase was a naturally occurring molecule, much less the correlation. So again, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being, when I say all hell broke loose, it did. And it wasn't just in the sense of having difficulties in work. And then with the patent office, the patent office, understandably, examiner saying, well, gee, I wish I could help you, but I don't know what to do, and I can't. So it, the, the, even that dynamic was breaking down. Then people just really let the patent office know what they thought about this. Uh, the patent office got pummeled by this, which ultimately uh, resulted in the guidelines that just came out. So then what happened is, and it just happened really, it was just last month, literally, the Patent Office, in view of, of what had happened, uh, issued brand new guidelines. And it, it wasn't just additive guidelines. They said, these completely replace the ones that we gave you in March. So in other words, it wasn't just to, to flesh around. It was just a swap and said, we're backing off what we said before. Here's what we're saying now. And the, 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 the dominant theme of the new guidelines has to do with how much are you, meaning the, the proposed patentee, monopolizing these general principles that are the underpinnings of what you're trying to invent, if I were to just articulate it that way. Uh, there's also, and I'll get into this in a minute, a big focus in these guidelines, which conversely leaves a question about other really important types of inventions, on the naturally occurring or naturally derived products. Uh, I should be run out of town by even having a slide like this up here because it's so cramped and so forth and so on. And I ran myself out of town, but Michael and I were feeling sorry for ourselves <laughs> about how we always have to look at dense printed matter, and so we did. <laughs> so it's all there, um, but I promise you I'm not gonna read it, uh, but in terms of just the highlights of this, Basically, what the Patent Office has laid out is a three-part hierarchical type of an analytical grid. Three turnstiles that are taken in order. One, two, three. And all three actually are here, which is why there was method to the madness about putting it all in one place. But basically, all of the, all of the, all of, mo well, I should say, most of the, most of the action and fireworks are going to revolve around item number two and then secondarily item number three. And the reason why I say that is because item number one basically just asks, well, is your invention a process, a thing, or a machine? 
answer yes. Uh, you, you know, you'll never say no to something like that. Um, so, and again, I'm, I'm not saying it like that to trivialize what the Patent Office said the, the, or the analysis. This, this is based on the statute. But the point is, is that you always go through that turnstile. So then all the, all the density is really around items number two and three. Just a couple of salient points. One is that in terms of what is item number two, item number two is asking the more rhetorical question of, is this claim that you are putting forth directed to a natural principle, an abstract idea, a natural product, meaning is it front and center, is it really facing that, as opposed to the more ancillary, does it involve one of these principles? So involve is a much easier way to say, well, yes, it does, and therefore you're in trouble. Um, so the Patent Office was even careful with their language here. In terms of the pro natural product side of this, they were very, very careful. They absolutely backed off this, uh, anything that's, in, that's a protein, an antibody, a DNA, except for the isolated, which is just dead forever now, uh, they said, you know, is, is this product the same as the naturally occurring product or is there something different about it? And the something different can be not only just structure now, it used to be just structure, although to me structure function, they're like this, but any, anything that's different between what is known to exist in nature to what you are trying to claim. So for, for example, even a, theoretically a pharmaceutical composition is certainly different than what occurs in nature. So there's a lot of action around there, and the Patent Office actually streamlined, tried to streamline some of this evaluation so that, again, it's sort of like the converse of the old Monopoly game, do not pass go, do not collect 200, you know, you go, sh you bypass. And they, they have a couple of provisions built in here to bypass. One is what I just said about the naturally occurring product. Once you show that, then they're finished and they're okay about that. Um, another one is, if it seems absolutely clear to them that you are not monopolizing the entire product or principle, they will completely bypass and say you don't have a problem. Classic example that they provided themselves is, I claim a chair that is coated with wood. Well, you're not dominating and, and, and trying to dominate every piece of wood that's ever been made, so that sort of thing. Um, finally, uh, is, the, is the third piece of this, in other words, if you don't get the bypass based on the second piece, you go to the third, and the third has to do with trying to establish m more that you are not, repeat, not trying to dominate and encompass and monopolize the natural type of principle or abstract idea that somewhere resides within your claim. Now, I didn't do this. The Patent Office did this. <laughs> but again, it just shows how they tried to graphically depict the decision tree flow chart and how it plays out here. And so, for example, what I had referred to as question number one is that first kind of reverse diamond on the top. And the second one is item two, which is, if you're claiming a product that ties to nature, how different is it than what is in nature? It has to be significantly different. It has to be requisitely different. But based on their examples, it doesn't take a lot to, to, to pull back that way. Or is, is, your, is your invention not directed to a natural phenomenon or principle? So that's, so where, in terms of their flow chart, where you want to end up is, is on the left-hand side. You want to be going in that direction and not to the right. And then finally, the last diamond reflects item number three or, or turnstile number three, which is can you, can you show that you are significant? I'm, I'm using the term different, different. In a sense, really what they're trying to get at there is even though they use the word more, they really should have used the word less in my mind. You, 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 you're trying to establish that you're smaller than the whole principle by which somehow drives what you are trying to claim. For example, only this subset of markers, not all the markers that could be apropos. A certain disease indication, not every, every can, you know, those kinds of things. Say, I am not monopolizing 
the correlation, to use it that way, the, what I would call like the correlative core. Uh, I, I, meaning the proposed patentee, am not, am not monopolizing that. For example, I am not monopolizing the law of gravity. I am not monopolizing the law of this correlation that this is how you can identify this type of group of patients, for example. This is literally just out, as I noted, and we're seeing differences already in terms of how the patent office is functioning. Uh, interestingly, even as these deadlines, I mean, sorry, guidelines, <laughs> guidelines came out, uh, two examiners looking at even the same kind of claim and invention would come out completely differently as far as what the outcome, and, and what, what the patent office is trying to do here, again, is standardize, calm it down, and uh, you know, try to let more of this go through based on how they're viewing the law. So in summary, the, the news is good in terms of where is the U.S. at any rate patent office in terms, I mean, a year ago when we were standing here, it, it, it couldn't have been much more draconian. Now, mind you, undeterred, uh, we press on and we get, we get coverage for what needs to be but it, it, it still is more, much more problematic. Here, it's clear that the, the Patent Office has loosened their standards, not loosened in an inappropriate way. It's completely within the auspices of what the uh, Supreme Court has said. Uh, they, they, if anything, tend to be conservative, but they have loosened it because of the, 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 guide, the previous guidelines wreak such havoc. And they, ha interestingly, though, there's a little bit of pocket of, of uncertainty, which is to say, They've made it quite clear in terms of the naturally derived product sphere, what is a yes and what is a no. Uh, they made a number of examples, and it's, it's pretty crisp to read that and understand it. Where they haven't come out with are the methods, which are absolutely key in this area, in personalized medicine also. It's not to say that they're indicating that they're going to be just as draconian as, as they had been, but they haven't come out with concrete examples too much about this. They say they're going to, um, and th this is a more challenging and problematic area, I would say. But at least, again, the, the, the trend is very good. The setting is much better. It's much more friendly, I would say, and I think it'll be, don't you agree, more consistent. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So in t dovetailing right into this, in terms of str strategic considerations, where does that leave us? That's always the thing we try to ask ourselves so we can be as vigorous and creative as we can. Uh, well, the, the first point here about simple correlations, what we mean is a very, a very fundamental, simple one-to-one -one kind of correlation. Uh, the more conceptual a claim is that way, the much more difficult time it's going to have. And so we, we think in terms of methods, those are still going to have a hard time unless something additional is added to those kinds of claims to constrict them and constrict them in a way that speaks to the patent office. Tied to that, the companion diagnostic strategy, which ties to methods, for example, identification, then treat. Identification, then treat a certain way because this is a better responder or less responder, that sort of thing. Those, those would probably would do fine under this way the patent office is looking at it to say, you're not monopolizing everything, are you? And you, you say, no, I'm not. But as Michael's going to talk about in a second, there's a trade-off in that. So um, simple correlations are out, but the good news is that for uh, multi-analyte index assays like CardioDx's Chorus CAD or Crescendo's Vector DA test, we have multiple inputs to a single output. Those seem to be okay, although the patent office still is shifting around on the basis for which they're going to grant them. So in some instances, we're seeing that if you recite assay steps, that's okay. In other cases, we see if you recite algorithms, maybe that's not okay. And I think the take home message here is that it's still shifting. You mm -hmm. wanna talk a little bit about US versus X here? Yes, this is a key point that's in the middle of the slide. As, as I've been careful to try to articulate while we're talking about this, we, we've been talking about the US Patent Office reaction 
for obvious reasons. Not only is this is where we are, but it's typically the biggest market, those kinds of things. And it's, you know, it's just hugely important value driver. Uh, that being said, interestingly enough, this is a U, pretty much to completely a U.S. only phenomenon, at least so far. For example, Europe, other countries, they get hung up about other things that can make life very difficult. Believe me, uh, they do. Um, and I, I don't say that with disrespect, but what I mean is with respect to this issue, though, they are not bothered by this. So again, in terms of strategy, you have to look at it kind of split brain, you know, it's the U.S. isn't everything unless you've decided it is. But, you know, in terms of strategy, you don't, you don't, for example, want to uh, create your IP strategy as though the U.S. is the only country you can actually go broader, pr presumably, in other countries, at least certainly up until now you've been able to. The, the last point I want to make on this slide is that some of the things that you'll add for patent eligibility can come back to bite you when you go to enforce your patent. Mm -hmm. So um, in the U.S., it's the law that all steps of a patent have to be practiced by either a single entity or somebody that's under the direction of a single entity. This is the so-called law of divided infringement. So if you add a step, like I have to perform the assay steps and then I analyze, or you add a step, like I have to get the result and then I have to treat, mm -hmm. you can wind up with a divided infringement problem because two different entities that are not being directed by a single common mastermind could be performing those steps. And the Supreme Court is tinkering with this law as well. So stay tuned. We'll have more to say about that next year. I uh, want to make sure we leave time for Jose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk very, very quickly uh, how it's playing out on the courts. So uh, Myriad, there was a Federal Circuit decision in December with Ambry, where the Federal Circuit slammed Myriad both on the um, primer set claims, composition of matters, those were products of nature, and on the comparison mm -hmm. between a patient's um, BRCA sequence and the wild type, that was an abstract idea. And following that, just two days ago, Myriad settled the remainder of its suits. Um, Jose is going to talk about the stock price, and the other point I'll make very quickly is that there is litigation that's been going on. The prenatal diagnostics, Ariosa and Sequinome have been mixing it up, and uh, basically Ariosa knocked out Sequinome's 504 patent by um, saying that its methods using cell-free fetal DNA, which were paternally inherited as a way of figuring out fetal abnormalities, were basically patent ineligible because cell-free fetal DNA is a product of nature and the rest of the steps in the claim were just conventional. Mm -hmm. Jose, over to you. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, so in having this discussion, um, they asked me to join them last year to, to really discuss how this loss of protectability um, and the shifting landscape, as, as we can see, has really played out in the public markets, not just for Myriad Genetics, but the companies in this space, and ultimately how we look at private companies that are attempting to go public. So um, I am required to disclose that we, might, we may or may not talk about any or all of these companies in the, in the process of this discussion. The, um, the companies in blue are the ones I actively cover as a publishing analyst. So with that in mind, when we think about history, we, we like to start with charts. Uh, and, and pictures t tell a thousand words. So on the top chart is price. Um, this is Mirror Genetics' share price over the last two years. The red vertical line is roughly the time that the Supreme Court decision happened. And you can see that in terms of price, um, mirrored stock went down shortly afterwards and, uh, to use a very technical term, ripped at the end of January uh, of 2014 as the, 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 the massive amount of competition and, and share loss and revenue declines just didn't happen. But you can see that since then it's pretty much been a dead stock. It's traded sideways. It has not really returned much unless you played it in very short-term intervals. Um, Mary would probably say that's a good thing, at least that it hasn't gone down. But one of the things we often look at when, when looking at sectors and companies overall is also sentiment, and that's what the, the uh, bottom two graphs uh, are trying to illustrate. Um, the second from the top is short interest, and the bottom is days to cover. This is basically, you can see that there's been a substantial increase in the number of people who are betting that the fundamentals for Myriad Genetics as a company are going to, de going to decline that whether it's competition, market share loss, pricing, will all impact top line growth, ultimately reducing the earnings growth, which will ultimately lead to, to a, a fall in the stock price. Um, the, um, the, the next question is then, well, what's happened to the business since then? 
right? So if we look at Myriad, very shortly after the decision, Myriad really evolved as a company where their cycle time to launching new products was about two years. But shortly after that, you can see that um, in September of uh, 2013, they launched MyRisk, which is eventually what BRCA1, BRCA2 turned into. They went into lung melanoma, they, they acquired Crescendo, went into BRCA analysis. And so their cycle time increased by about 18 months. And so to offset the fear of competitive risk, investors, remember this, we're, we're writing history here, so investors are learning as we go. So they learned that cycle time and the rapid, rapid R&D pipeline became more and more important as you try to diversify the risk of, 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 uh, of competition. And that's one of the things that Myriad taught us over that, over that point in time. Um, one other thing that, to emphasize that channel strength became really important. So from a, from a language perspective, you started to hear Myriad talk like Medtronic or Boston Scientific or St. Jude does about the, uh, the ability of their sales forces to penetrate deeply into accounts, to own a channel, really became a, very evident that they wanted to be the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and good luck if you're going to try to be somebody else. Um, and while it's not on this slide, there's been an increasing emphasis on international growth. So again, the takeaway from Myriad was that they wanted to diversify their business. They wanted to increase the number of products out in the pipeline and diversify their risk. Now, that's just Myriad. Now, I want to bring up another company, one of my favorite ones that everybody in this room knows, to illustrate how that perspective bled over to some other companies and eventually the whole space. And so, this is Foundation Medicine. Um, aside from the massive increase in share price that happened a few weeks ago, um, Foundation has largely traded sideways since its IPO. Um, it went public in September of 2013, just six months or so after... Um, I'm sorry, about four, four months after the, the U.S. Supreme Court decision. And you can see that it, it too, was, was succumbed to some of this perspective that um, nothing is protectable. Um, the share prices have traded sideways. The short interest, um, this, is, this slide has, been, uh, has not been updated for, for last week, by the way. So I'm willing to bet the, share, the short interest has come down. But overall, there's, a, there's been a, a huge bet out there that somebody somewhere would copycat the foundation model. After all, if it can happen to Myriad, it can happen to anybody else. And then those of you who are familiar with founda how foundation works, it's six high seek 2500s in a room with a very proprietary um, uh, database behind it. And the overarching short thesis was that, gee, why can't I do that? Um, so, that's foundation. Um, they, had a very ra they have a very rapid cycle time, right? They came into the market saying, we can kick out a product at roughly 18 months. They launched Foundation One uh, Solid Tumor in May of 2012, uh, Foundation One Heme in December of 2013, Liquid Biopsy in late 2015, and Immuno-Oncology products should start hitting the street in 16 or 17. In the last two are my estimates, not the companies. They have, they have not said anything publicly about that. But, the important thing to note is that foundation as a business model and as a value creator was entirely new to us on Wall Street and certainly for many of our clients. Um, the, the, the bear call was that it was an undifferentiated front end. Right? The first mover advantage was not sustainable. So you hear echoes of the myriad um, thesis here. Anybody can build a patient database. And really the focus became on how many tests you could sell in a quarter. There was no value being ascribed to, to the database behind it, to the mining, to the algorithms, to, to that being able to, to eventually translate into shareholder value. Um, and interestingly, this was a thesis really purported by what I would call med tech or tools investors, which by discipline, not by choice, but by discipline and history, tend to be very, very um, short-term minded. What this means for a lot of companies that are going public or are thinking about going public is that it increases the burden on them to be able to tell their story and really define how to drive value off of the data component of their story. And in biotech, we know how to do that. When a small company partners off a drug to a large company, there are milestones, there are upfront payments. We, we know there are corollaries by which drugs penetrate in the market. Since we don't know any of that at this point, it's really tough to put a number about on it, and 
on Wall Street, we tend to like numbers. Now, the, the, um, the bull call was very biotech-y, if, if I can use that term. So technology agnostic, but value evolves as our, as our knowledge improves. Secondly, there was a certain amount of faith, right? They have a lot of part, foundation has a lot of pharma partnerships, obviously Roche now, but even before this, there was this notion that there's something in this model, there's something in this data, there's something in this company that people who are a heck of a lot smarter than I am see value to, and I don't get it, but some, those guys are probably right. Um, <laughs> The questions were different, very long-term minded, right? How does the data derive value in the long run? And not surprisingly, this was a thesis very much um, held by either biotech investors or generalist healthcare investors who had no bias coming into the, into the stock. So from foundation, we, 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 we walk away from this thinking that you know, Myriad really created a bias against proprietary testing companies. Even if Roche hadn't happened a couple of weeks ago, the stock probably would have still traded sideways. Um, new business models, new ways of deriving value need to be more succinctly defined for our investors. So if we can put a number on it, then we can give you credit for it, frankly. But it's difficult to do since, we're, like I said, we're writing history right now. Um, and it's, it's cer almost certainly going to cause confusion, so be prepared for that. It's not worth it to say, well, foundation, we have a foundation to myriad, well, what about everybody else? If we look across the entire space of companies and just look at what I call platform companies, and that would be Illumina, Cepheid, Genmark, that, and Nanostring, that type of companies, versus uh, Myriad Genomic Health, uh, Foundation Medicine, as well as some other companies in space, you see that this, it's still true. In fact, you can, you can look at um, that divergence between the red and the uh, blue lines, and, and that's right where the Supreme Court date happened. The minute that case went down, you can see that short interest started to grow in the um, proprietary uh, in the uh, proprietary testing companies versus platform companies have pretty much been sideways in terms of the number of people who get them, uh, betting against them. And I can tell you now, nobody is short Illumina. Right? You, just, you, don't, you just don't short that company. Um, same thing with days to cover. Uh, people are, are the, the, the short, or what we call a crowded short, it is becoming more increasingly crowded as people are betting more and more against proprietary testing. Um, hmm. One thing I want to emphasize, things change, right? Prior to the Myriad decision, we wouldn't have, we, this, this, these graphs would never have diverged. And so even though investors believe that there is likely to be competition, when you prove them wrong, valuation fixes itself. Um, but so this is where we are today. Not surprisingly, if you look at the performance of the various subsectors within diagnostics, proprietary custom, testing companies have grossly underperformed everybody else. Um, platform companies have done well, even point of care testing and diversified diagnostics companies have been the place that people want to play um, as opposed to a proprietary t testing company. Valuations, same thing. Um, valuations are, if you're a plat quote unquote a platformer, you're likely to pick up higher valuations than uh, the other sectors. And if you're a proprietary di diagnostic, a proprietary testing company, you're likely to be below the average. Uh, more specifically, this is public comps as of last week, and we're looking in the red here. These are forward estimates. If you look at the top section, and again, I, I should be run out of town for making this so dense, but you look, the, the, um, the public diagnostic comps are around six times forward sales right now if you're a platformer, and about four times if, if you're a proprietary, a proprietary test. Mm -hmm. So that's a big difference if you're talking about millions of dollars of valuation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still playing out this way. Mm -hmm. And this is the comp set for the diversifieds and the point of care groups. And you can see that there, there isn't, you know, the, the, uh, even, even the diversified companies get a, get a better valuation. Um, point of care tends to be the lowest of all of them. So now what, right? I've painted a great picture as to why you want to be a public company in this space. Um, the space. Uh, the, the Myriad case, again, made investors highly skeptical about the long-term value of a proprietary, proprietary test, even if that thesis ultimately is wrong. You have to remember that my clients have to manage portfolios of 24, 50, 60 companies. They're not going to spend as much time as my counterparts here on stage trying to understand the nuances of why your IP portfolio is better than the next company. 
Um, they do still tend to assign higher valuations to scalable technology platforms. There is, they're now starting to understand that there is value in data, that there is value in, in phenotype and genotype put together. Um, whether it's companion diagnostics, whether it's partnerships, whether it's the foundation model or 23andMe or pick your company, they're just starting to understand that the value isn't on the front end necessarily, that it's on the back end. That doesn't mean they know how to quantify it. It just means qualitatively, they know that there's something there and they're willing to listen a little bit more and that wasn't the case six months ago. Rate of innovation, still very important. Um, obviously with the advent of next generation sequencing and the other technologies that we have out there, Investors believe they don't have, have to wait three or four years for this second generation product to come online. Um, this might make the hair on the back of my counterparts next cringe, but IP is really not an issue for most of my investors. They assume that someone's gonna come up behind you and, and try to copycat you. Regulatory reimbursement adoption still the key value drivers to growth until they can understand how you leverage the data component of your business. Um, final comments. As far as the street is concerned, this is, there's never been a better time to be a public company in this space. And it, even if you, if you can get past the valuation issues, and we try to talk CEOs through this all the time, right, there is a need for small cap product. Right? There, there, has, there has been a decimation in small cap life sciences over the last decade or so, and they need more issues, they need more ways to play this. Um, secondly, what I've emphasized is because innovation is happening, happening at a pace that is far too fast for, the, for most of my clients to grasp, it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to control the conversation. And Mike Pellini at Foundation does this really, really well. Mary Dash does it very well, uh, very well too. So as you are innovating, as you're changing, it's an, it's an opportunity to teach, which I think most of us in this room still like to do. Lastly, get used to the short interest. You know, we like our, our, our animal metaphors. I like the word term dances with wolves. Um, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. That really does matter in this case. Um, you will almost never know who they actually are, so it's best to be friends with everybody. But it is a fact of life. Um, and then if you spend too much time worrying about it, then I worry that you're not running your business. So um, just deal with it. <laughs> Lastly, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty simple folk on Wall Street. We really live by two rules. It's either greed or fear. Um, so on the greed side, there, there, there really are starting to grasp that there are huge implications to the work that's being done by everybody in this room and everyone outside it. Beyond oncology, beyond consumer health, beyond diagnosis and treatment. And while it's very difficult to put a dollar sign in front of all of that, Nobody wants to miss the boat, right? And so they're more likely to listen to you and listen to the opportunity than to say, I don't want to play in this space. Um, and that leads to fear. No one wants to miss the boat on, on this level of innovation. And so despite what we've seen in, in the multiples, despite what we've seen in the price performance, there is a huge appetite for companies in this space. It's just we have to work with the realities of how we value the companies. and. Um, Hopefully that changes in the near term, but I can tell you there's, there's a, there's a, it's a very good time um, as people are educating themselves about this space.